When I, when I was six, I got on a plane, plucked my blissfully ignorant life out of India, and dropped it right in the middle of sunny Abbott, Dubai. That, predictably, changed my perspective. Now, my narrative isn't about getting used to the towering skyscrapers or the hustle and bustle of the city. It's about getting used to this confusing hybrid cultural identity that all the other kids living here seem to have developed. And the classism and implicit discrimination that subsequently reveal themselves to me. I'll explain what I mean by hybrid identity. So at school, we'd have ethnic days or parties where you were supposed to wear ethnic clothing. And on those days, you could wear the prettiest lehengas and salwars, the fake jewelry your mom would make you put on, your friends would want to take pictures and all that jazz. But if you wore traditional clothing outside of school, you were a sore loser. We were celebrating our culture, and yet we were embarrassed of it. None of it made any sense to me. Those first three months, I did a lot of short-range reconnaissance. You know, listening to my friends speak, but not really contributing to the conversation. And here's what I discovered. So I could like Bollywood movies, but not all of them were cool. And I could listen to Hindi songs, but only the ones I could dance to. And media and other vernaculars? Forget about it. I had to collect Happy Meal toys every week for some reason, and I could like Taylor Swift, but not Britney Spears. Makes no sense, right? It was this bizarre set of rules and structures that were downright confusing, and more times than not, made me feel inferior. I remember telling a couple of my friends that my family didn't own a car at the time, and their immediate reaction was, you don't have a car, as if that somehow made me less deserving of their attention or friendship. And so eventually, I adopted that identity. I begged my parents for a car. I begged them for a Gmail account just because everyone else had one. I listened to every Top 40 song that had come out in the past year, so I'd know what my friends were singing. And I learned to say my R's and T's a different way that I evidently still haven't gotten rid of. And all of it just begs the question, what prompted a group of second graders to distance themselves from their culture and heritage in such an absurd manner. Maybe it had something to do with the lack of positive representation, but I can't give a definite answer to that question. While in the years since then, I have learned that my culture isn't inferior to others, I sometimes still subconsciously act with that mindset. Something that's been prevalent for a long time throughout the world is colorism. The idea that certain skin tones, you know which ones, are superior to others. And while we're quick to call out Hollywood and teen magazines for whitewashing and photoshopping lighter skin tones onto their models, fairness creams are still being sold. And our parents tell us, don't spend too much time in the sun, you'll get darker. We can debate police brutality in the US for hours and end. But we can't bear to bring up the honor killings throughout Asia or the Rohingya crisis. Why do we choose to actively ignore the issues that impact us on a much deeper and profound level? Because it's easier. It's easier to talk about it when you're not expected to do anything about it. But when are we going to start doing something about it? And here's the thing. Change doesn't have to start big. I've grown used to taking the metro or walking around in malls, and it's kind of surprising that I've only very recently noticed how much of a cultural melting pot I live in. Because I see women wearing hijabs and dreadlocks and Dutch wigs, dressed in jeans or abayas or salwars, reading books in Arabic or English or Russian, which is something you don't see everywhere in the world. All the unrest and conflict of late has made me realize that I've ended up somewhere people can coexist, regardless of religion, caste, creed, or ethnicity. I've had the chance to meet so many different people who represent a multitude of languages and cultures and customs. And I am immensely grateful for that, because it's taught me to be part of my own, 
It's taught me to be proud of who I am and where I come from and to be unapologetic for it. It's taught me that it is possible to adapt to different surroundings without intrinsically changing myself. I mentioned being grateful and gratitude has become so important to me. And here's why. It's in human nature to be greedy and to always want more. And that's made me bitter and unhappy more times than I could ever count. But gratitude can change that and bring you an abundance of new perspectives and outlooks and worldviews. I'm grateful to have received all the opportunities that I have today to be getting a stellar education from a reputed school, to have my voice bearing out a speaker when so many go unheard. I'd like to be a medium for those voices. It's in no way right that entire groups of people are discriminated against and denied countless opportunities, and not even on the basis of their actions, but simply for who they are. I've come to realize that those things I mentioned being grateful for, this very forum, have put me in a unique position of privilege. And it's my sincere hope that using that privilege, I can make some change, big or small, in the world for better. And I'm asking you to do the same, not by protesting or picket fencing, but through small acts of courage, like being yourself, so that you can inspire others to do the same and so that we can stand united in our diversity. Thank you.